I was singing so hard, I spilled water all over the place. I'm the only one in here other than the tech crew. It's kind of weird, but amen. I'm here and I'm, I'm excited to be here to, to sing these songs. The lyrics kind of really got me going. Uh, so I'm grateful to just be here. 2021 is here. 2020 was craziness. Wow. Thank Bye 2020, right? We want to get rid of that. Uh, but hey, there were some great moments in 2020. A lot of new people added to the family of God. Amen. We saw God do miracles in, in so many ways. Even in my personal life, able to see my mom, you know, get married to a great man, Bob King. Wow, what a great, I mean, that highlighted in so many ways. Celebrated some more years, 21 years with my wife. And in three days, my wife going to turn 50. 50. What? When did that happen? I met that woman. We were in our 20s, right? Crazy how time flies. But wow, it was a crazy year last year. You know, this slide right here, somebody, when I put it up, they said, you're going to make somebody mad. I said, well, good. That's the point. Because 2020 made everybody mad on some level. It was craziness going on. Not to the racial strife, the political madness, right? That's still going on. But don't even forget the natural disasters. I mean, Mark Ottenwell, a brother we love, I mean, his family, they had like two hurricanes in like the same month or something. It was, it was crazy, right? Uh, don't forget about that stuff. People are still struggling to get their lives back together. And of course, I mean, we're still dealing with this, this coronavirus. And, and in some respects, right, the worst it's been. Okay? The worst it's been in our country. So, whoo, 2020. In 2021, this thing is still here, but God is still God is still in control. God is still amazing. God is still worthy to be praised. And that is what we are here to do. And uh, as Sherwin mentioned, we had talked about this, and I mentioned it last week. We had thought about what could be some things that we could emphasize from the scriptures. And, and the theme that just made sense to a lot of us really was the concept of faithful together. This year has split us apart in many ways, not just physically where we aren't even worshiping together. That for sure has been a challenge. But there's been a lot of division and, and causing us to question so much. But we thought we need, we need to emphasize these aspects of, of Scripture, of, of being faithful together. But what does faithful really mean? And in the Old Testament, the word faithful is used many times. The New Testament, right, this concept is central to the Bible. And the word faithful, whether it's the Hebrew or whether it's in the Greek, there are similar concepts that keep coming to the fore, right? Belief, conviction, reliable, sure, trustworthy, true. These are things firm, stable, faithful. We need each other, right? Amen. To stay faithful. And we thought about this is a great theme and we will we'll pray together. We'll fast together. We'll serve the poor together. And it'll be powerful. But you know, the thing is, it's a fine line, especially how many of us think. Once we start thinking about faithful together and we start thinking about what faithful is, you know what we immediately do? Some of us, we immediately go to ourselves. I hope I have enough belief. I want to have enough conviction. I want to be firm. Am, am I firm in my faith? How truthful am I? How, how good am I doing? Am I stable? Am I firm? And we, we start with ourselves. And I appreciate it. I, I think it was Lynn. She might have mentioned like, you know, Probably be wise to not just start with how we need to do this together. Probably wise to start with God, right? Because we all want to hear, you know, the parable Jesus told. We all want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. But sometimes we just try to stack a bunch of great spiritual achievements on top of each other. And we kind of get burnt out sometimes. So we're going to look at how he is faithful. <laughs> if we can start there. If we can start with God, start with God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. If we start there and focus there and get our conviction there and anchor there, man, we'll be faithful together and it'll change the world. It really will change the world. And that's the heart behind what we're going to be talking about today. And my, my role is just to look at, we're gonna look at kind of creation and Genesis, some aspects of Genesis, and how we can be inspired by God's faithfulness from the, from the first book of the Bible. And that'll be my attempt, anyway, today. And we'll look, and in, in future messages, we'll look at other major parts 
of the Old Testament. We'll look at Jesus. We'll look at the church and the spirit. So we'll look at, we'll start there. And then we'll kind of really focus in on, on what we're doing. Amen. So let, let's go to God in prayer. Father, I pray that this morning we can be inspired by you. That we can take the focus off of anything else going on and fix our gaze on your nature, your character, your name, who you are, your heart, your intent, and be inspired by your faithfulness. And I pray that we just have hearts that erupt in praise in whatever way that is for each person. You are worthy of it. And I pray that we are inspired by how truthful you are, how sure, how stable, how firm, how reliable, and how worthy you are of our belief in you. I pray that that can come through in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, how much time I got? Okay, cool. Here we go. We're going, we're going to the beginning. We're going to start right at the beginning, right? We're going to look at the faithfulness of God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. You know, we could read this entire passage. I read this over and over this week, and I'm telling you, if you allow it to, it will inspire you of the heart of God, the creativity of God, the power of God, the beauty of God, but yes, the faithfulness of God. And if you really allow this, this story, it's not a myth in the sense of it's not true. This is, there are truths in here that we need or else we will get off track as humans. We need to understand what's going on here. You know, and, 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 and what is underappreciated, I believe, in our culture is the ways in which God shows himself to be true and reliable through creation. I think we miss that. I think we're more enamored with what, what's coming out with the next iPhone. What, what new camera technology coming up next? And we get all inspired by that. But we wake up and we see what's going on in the sky. We see what's happening with the trees. And we go, oh, um, uh, I'm used to that. And we, Oh, my goodness. We're like spoiled kids that get something so early. We don't even know what the value of it is. And we blow it off. And I'm telling you, we need to focus here <laughs> to really appreciate the faithfulness of God. And all through the creation, we see that there's, the beginning is, is formless, it's empty, it, it's dark, it's chaotic. And immediately God provides some structure to separating darkness and, and light, and it is good. And he goes through, and we know, I mean, Jeff, this is kingdom kid stuff. I learned this a long time ago. Well, so did I, but I read my Bible every year, and this still in it. So it's helpful for you if you allow it to be. But think about what God is doing. He's creating out of chaos, out of darkness, out of emptiness, out of formlessness. Lack of meaning, really. He's infusing things like light. He's creating the structure. He's, he's, he's forming the world, so to speak. And then he fills it with, with the animals and the fish. And there's order, there's structure. God knows what he's doing. And if you, allow, if you think about this and reflect on this, it will help you believe God's reliable. He's trustworthy. He knows what he's doing. He can take care of us. And the beauty of the whole story, in so many ways, similar to a wedding, and I've done many weddings. If you pulled a guy, you know, who'd never been to a wedding before, maybe from a totally different culture, right, and dropped him into a wedding in our culture, and you ask him after it was over, what was the moment that was really different in your opinion? And he'll go say, man, when that bride came down, whoa, that was amazing. Yeah. That's when, it, that's when it all rise, you know, everybody stands up, everybody's looking at her. She's got the most ornate outfit on. Sometimes people are behind her. People went before her to drop stuff down. So, it, it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a moment where you go, this is different. Things have been culminating to this point. 
And in creation, amen for the sky and the structure, amen for that, amen for the fish and the sea, amen for making boundaries and separating the water from the land and the sky from the, let's, let's get it straight. But then it's like, hold up, hold up. And the only time in creation that there's a hold up, there's the, the only time when you get even into the intention of why, because there's no scripture that says, and God created this because he was, no. But, but he does stop the press and say, hold up. When it comes to people, this is different. The humans are going to be made in our image. My likeness. This is huge. And then he says, so they may rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the animals, over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God who created them, male and female, he created them. Me and you, we're different. All of that creation was actually for us so that we could actually thrive and have a place that we could actually thrive. We are his crowning achievement. And if you allow it, if you actually just stop for five minutes and think about how God chose to create all of this for you and me, that can help you appreciate who he is and that he is trustworthy. That if he says light needs to happen and light happens, if he says, hey, you need to be separated from this, and if he says, let me create a boundary here, and if he says, you are different, you're special, you're unique, you have a role unlike anything else I've ever created. In fact, you're going to represent me on earth. You're my representative. You reflect me. That's, that, that, thank you, God. We should be praising God for this role that he's given us. And then God blesses people. <laughs> I mean, wow, like, go oh, be fruitful. Go all over the world and fill it, subdue it. And everything is under you. And he's not done. You think, golly, he just, he's just showering on people. This is not the aardvark. This is not the flounder. This is people. He said, I give you every seed-bearing plant, right? They will be yours. Look at these phrases. I give you. They will be yours. I give you everything. I mean, this is the heart of God, too, his benevolent heart. And if God says it, then it should be so. We need to accept that and appreciate our role in the world. I like this quote. The non-human creation, right, the sea, the sky, all that stuff, everything but us, should, should give us the opportunity to praise God for the ordered, reliable, life-giving character of the world as a gift of God. That's faithfulness. We need to appreciate the faithfulness of God, that he gave us such an ordered place to be, structured, He's behind it. His heart is behind it. He is benevolent. He is trustworthy. And when his will, when he says it, it comes to pass. And that's a beautiful thing. And that's how he made the world to be. And we need to be faithful in that and be grateful that that's the way he set things up. Imagine God's word. Just think about the power of God's word when you read this account. Right? He speaks and creation comes into being. His word and his spirit transform emptiness, darkness, and chaos into what? Into structure, light, and life with meaning. You and I have meaning. Science, they try to pit science and faith and all that. You don't have to pit those against each other. What, why would you have to do that? <laughs> science, amen, they're discovering things that God has put into place. Praise God. Praise wisdom that he's allowed us to have. We don't need to pit the two against each other. What science can't tell us is do we have meaning or not? But the scriptures can, and they do. And if you accept that God is faithful, he's true and trustworthy and reliable, then you will believe it, and you will refuse to not believe it. You won't let anybody else tell you anything different because God said it. And he desires what's good for us, right? And we are his crowning achievement, and we need to accept that 
and be grateful for that. And you go, okay, Jeff, I think I got that down. Okay, well, if you don't have it down, then we all in trouble. Because that's what the Bible teaches us. <laughs> that's exactly what the Bible teaches us. And you go, I know the story, but have you thought about and meditated on the story and your role in the story and my role in the story? The serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? What does this have to do with God's faithfulness? Everything. Everything. This is an assault on God's faithfulness. That's absolutely what this is. Because this crafty serpent, this representative of the anti-God, that evil, right, the accuser, the prosecutor, the, the adversary, what is he trying to get at? The absolute nature of what we're talking about. Can I get her? Can I get humans, this special creation, can I get them to actually doubt the faithfulness of God? Did God really say Doubt. Just plant that. Just a little doubt, right? That you must not eat from any tree. <laughs> wow. So what is that? That is distorting God's words, right? It, it emphasizes the prohibition stuff, right? What God has prohibited. Let's emphasize all the things that God prohibits. Instead of all the things that God has provided. We just went through all of creation. How could any human in their right mind think that God's holding out? He just said, I give you everything, right? And let's be clear. What did God say? He told Adam, the Lord commanded the man. Now, that's a strong word. Command the man. <laughs> you are free. What does that say? Hold up. You are free. That's a little different from you must not. Crafty. God said, hey, you're free. There's a lot more to, I'm offering freedom and, you know, provision. But yeah, there is, there, there are boundaries that I've set up. Just like I set up a boundary for the land and the water, just like I set up a boundary for the sky and what happens there and what happens on earth, what happens with the sea animals and what happens with the ones on the land? And there's a boundary between you and the knowledge of good and evil. And if you trust me, if you look at creation and you understand how reliable I am and how my words are true and what, what without my words, there's formlessness, there's emptiness, there's no meaning. With my words, with my spirit, there's life, there's provision. If you believe that, then you will know your place. And you will find peace and joy in your life. <laughs> Don't let that get robbed from you. Because it will be attempted to be robbed from you. And that's what the serpent is doing. And he knows he's doing it. And the woman said, hey, yeah, you know, oh, no, you know, we, we can eat from the fruit and the trees in the garden. But God did say, you know, you, you must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it or you will die. You must not touch it. Eh. There's no record of God saying that. And then the serpent, you will not certainly die. Ooh. That's just the one thing to make you doubt. And there's one thing to maybe distort the words. <laughs> but when God says you will die, and then the serpent, you won't die. Ooh. It's calling into question, is God reliable? Is he trustworthy? Is there another way to live this life other than the way God wants? <laughs> this is open defiance. And he's not done. You know, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleased to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband, thank you very much, who was with her, and he ate. There's a lot going on here, guys. 
When you eat from it, your eyes will be open. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Oh, it's actually delightful to disobey. There's actually benefit to do what God said don't do. Oh, my goodness. If this is not an assault on the faithfulness of God, then I don't know what is. And if you, if you have eyes to see and ears to hear, this is happening to you every day. In some form or fashion, whether it's the person at work, oh, you don't need to do all that, or, man, God, is, God ain't all that. Man, you, can, you can live like this. Or, don't be dogging me because of my choice. All of these things can get you to doubt. Is God's way really true and reliable? Should I really put my faith and my conviction and, and my belief in his worldview of how I need to be? Or is there another way that, man, if I just grab this and go my own route? <laughs> wow. You know, God set a boundary between us and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I believe for a reason, because we, we can't handle it. We don't know how to make a di differentiate between good and evil, true, false, right, wrong, just, or unjust. We weren't made to make those calls. God set a boundary, and if we trusted him, if we, you know what should have happened is the serpent came, and Eve was like, look, God, look around you, serpent. <laughs> you wouldn't even be here. None of us would be here. There's a gazillion trees up in here. There's only one I can't. If God got enough sense to make the daggum tree and all the fruit on it, if he got enough sense to when I wake up and I see all of this, if he has enough sense to give us relationships where I have no shame, I'm at peace, I love what I'm doing, if he got enough sense to do that, why in the world would I listen to you? And who are you anyway? I got too much faith in who God is to be messing around talking to you, man. Bye, snake. That's what should have gone down. If you don't have conviction in the faithfulness of God that he has put you here, to represent him, that when his word comes to you, you let it live out of you. His word, his will, your life. That's the beauty of it all. And that ain't just Old Testament. That's New Testament, kingdom of God stuff too. The Bible works together, my friends. I'm telling you, this is the way it should have gone down. Way more faith in God's word to dictate how you live your life. Instead of letting that snake slide in, doubt, distort, defy. And disobedience is delightful, all a lie. And that had catastrophic, catastrophic circumstances. When people stopped trusting the faithfulness of God, they lost their way. Now they think they can choose what's right and wrong. Cain, did Cain listen to the words of God? If he would have listened to the words that God gave him, hey, why are you down? If he had listened to those words and let those words live out in him and to be God's representative, would he have killed his brother? No. Come on, people. You just see the story spiral downward. You got Lamech talking about, man, I'm going to avenge people. I'm going to kill more people. I mean, it's just like, what is going on? Every pe person's thought is evil. God's like, wow, I got Noah. I mean, he's trying to figure things out. And what happened with Noah? What happened with Noah? Is that just a story like, oh, that was cool. Noah believed the word of God. He took, he, he listened to God's word, and he said, okay, you're trustworthy. It don't make no sense about rain. I don't even know what you're talking about. What do you mean a ship? I don't even know what that's all about. But God, he took God's word. And there's rain coming down behind me, too, on cue. Wow, sound team is on point today. Thank you very much. And then you get to the Tower of Babel. And you think, oh, that's just a weird story. Well, not really. <laughs> think about this story. Think about this story and all we're talking about. What was, God's, what was God's heart for people? To be in his image. To go out and to bear God's heart to the world. To, to rule over it, but in a benevolent, loving, I mean, in a way like God is doing. Right? And to, and to go over all the earth and, 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 and multiply and, and, and be his reflection to the whole world. So the Tower of Babel isn't some odd, weird story. This is intense. It's almost the pinnacle of what man's trying to do. What does the Bible tell us? 
They said, hey, let's, let's uh, make bricks, bake them thoroughly. So they used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. It's almost like, oh, we got some new technology. Let's try to figure it out. Let's do something with this, right? Hey, let us build for who? God, no, ourselves. Red flag. Let's build a city. When you study the Old Testament, especially Genesis, a lot of times the city, not good. Because people are just like congregating there and they get self-centered. Build a city with a tower that reaches the heavens. We don't like the fact that we're supposed to rule over the earth. We're going we to mess that boundary up too. Let's go all the way up to the heavens. There's probably stuff up there too. God holding out on us. It's probably nice up there. Let's make our way up too. Because if we do, we'll make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we'll be scattered over the face of the earth. Who would want to do that? God wants you to do that, fool. That's what God said. Scatter over the earth. Rule it. That's what you're supposed to do. Y'all going to sit around here and sit in one place and build a tower? What in the world? Because you don't trust the word of God. You don't believe it's firm and true. You better hold up your Bible, and you better stare at it this week, and you better affirm with God, I actually believe this is your word. And if it says it, that's what's going to be in my life. I'm going to represent you to my office complex, my, where I live in my apartment building, in my neighborhood. Your word needs to happen in my life. Because I heard about what happened in creation when your word came. Bam, look what we got. So I trust you. And I'm not listening to no craziness out there in this world. I'm over time, and I knew I would be, so I'm giving you homework. Hey, before Michelle started doing backflips up there telling me, because I know she is. So I'm going to give you some homework. Think about the Tower of Babel and all that was going on there, but then we get to Abraham. What's God going to do? What's he going to do? People just don't seem to get it. <laughs> Okay, so look at Abraham, especially the first three verses here, right? Do this in your small group. And look at Abraham's life and the call. Why would God choose one person? Why would he do that? And why this guy with his background? So why, I want you to, maybe, maybe this is some small group study for you, right? And I'm not going to harp on it now because you can always click on this later and go back to this slide or whatever. But here are some potential questions that you can do as a small group or you can just do with God, you and God, <laughs> just, or you and a friend, right? But, but think about Abram. Did, how did he show that he actually trusted in the word of God and wanted it done in his life? And when he didn't, what were the consequences? I mean, these are great discussions. And what about your life? Is God calling you to something like right now, does God's word find a humble servant in you? Or are you doubting, distorting, defying, and disobeying? It's a good question. We all struggle with this, right? <laughs> all right, so if you're going to take communion, which is what we're going to do soon, and you're at home in the living room or whatever, this is a good time to, you know, maybe get the bread, whatever beverage, wine, Fruit of, fruit of the vine, whatever it is. I'll read this passage and pray for the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> because this is something that was promised in Genesis as well. After Adam and Eve messed up, <laughs> you know, God said he had to do something. But he gave a little promise within cursing this serpent. He gave a promise. And in verse 15, you know, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He... At this point in the story, you don't know who the he is. It's Genesis. We don't know who the he is, right, at this point. He will crush your head, serpent, Satan, adversary, enemy. This person, this he is going to crush your head. You might strike his heel, but he's going to fatally take you out. And the beauty of this is that we know God's word is firm, truthful, reliable. We can believe it with conviction. He is faithful because we know this came to pass in Jesus. So let us be a people that when we see it written in the word, that we allow God's word to have impact on us to affect how we view the world because he is faithful. He is worthy. 
And let us pray. Father, we do want to be people who respect your word. And I pray that we're astounded. Astounded with creation. Astounded when we see the majesty of mountains and what you do with planets and stars and quarks and protons. Stuff we can't even see. It's, it's phenomenal. I could go on and on. But also, we also know what you can do in human hearts. Human hearts that are willing to listen to your word. And even if it goes against what we see with our eyes and what we've maybe experienced in our earthly lives, that we can trust that your word will produce that which is good for us. Just like in creation, everything produced what was good for us. We trust your word even today in 2021. We can read your word and put it into practice, and it will produce what is good for us, even if we momentarily have to go through turmoil. We learned that in the life of Jesus, and we are grateful that you sent Jesus, that you came among us, and that he crushed the head of the serpent, defeating him, dying on the cross, and rise, ra being raised from the dead by your power. We celebrate Jesus. We celebrate how this Genesis promise came true. And we celebrate knowing that he will come back and there will be a new heaven and a new earth and we won't have to worry about any more of these serpents and your faithfulness will be so obvious, so amazing. And we will worship you with every ounce of who we are. May we start that today and not wait till after we have to die or Jesus comes back. We pray in his name. Amen.